Mrs. Gloria Barker and members of the Barker family, members of the NUS faculty and the law faculty in particular, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to you all. I am very honored and happy to be here for this special occasion to launch the E.W. Barker Center for Law and Business and to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the NUS Faculty of Law. I'm particularly glad to have Mrs. Barker and all her children here with us today, including the daughters, Carla and Deborah, both of whom graduated from NUS Law or its predecessor. It's fitting to name the Center of Law and Business after Mr. Barker, Singapore's first and longest serving law minister. He was an accomplished lawyer. He won the Queen's Scholarship. He read law at Cambridge together with his friends, my parents, the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and Madam Kwa Gyok Chu, who had also been in Raffles College here. Mr. Barker played a pivotal role in our separation from Malaysia. On Mr. Lee's instructions, he drafted the separation agreement the Amendment Bill for the Constitution of Malaysia and the Proclamation of Singapore. These foundation documents were the legal basis for our independence. They made it happen. Fifty years later, none of the provisions in the documents have ever been disputed or challenged. Not even fundamental provisions, such as the guarantees of the water agreements. Singaporeans owe a profound debt of gratitude to the draftsman of their independence, Mr. Barker. But Mr. Barker's contributions went beyond legal drafting. He and Dr. Go King Sui negotiated the terms of the separation with Tun Razak, who was then Malaysia's Deputy Prime Minister in Kuala Lumpur. Razak had been Mr. Barker's schoolmate in Raffles College, the predecessor of NUS, the negotiations were highly confidential and delicate, and Mr. Barker's friendship with Raza enabled the two sides to work out a solution amicably and to pull off this bloodless legal coup. They didn't talk about EQ then, but Mr. Barker possessed not only a very able legal mind, but also a first-class personality. After independence, Mr. Barker remained a key asset to the Singapore government. He helped smoothen our relations with Malaysia as he kept up friendships with old friends across the causeway, including the late Sultan of Johor and the Sultan of Pahang. As Law Minister, Mr. Barker oversaw the formation and development of our constitution. We'd inherited the British parliamentary system, but we could not simply adopt Westminster practices wholesale. The Wee Tong Jin Commission was set up to review the constitution. Arising from the Constitutional Commission's report, we introduced key safeguards, particularly the Presidential Council for Minority Rights, to ensure that minority rights are protected. Mr. Barker also drafted key pieces of legislation needed to govern Singapore, for example, the Land Acquisition Act, which enabled the government to acquire private land compulsorily for national development. But most of the land was encumbered with squatters. When the land was cleared for development, the displaced squatters had to go somewhere. And Mr. Barker played a role in this too, because as Minister for National Development, he helped to resettle displaced squatters quickly into newly built public housing. And this allowed us to develop Singapore rapidly, laying the foundation for modern Singapore. Mr. Barker was not just a legal eagle, he had a keen practical and political sense. In the 1960s, when our population was growing rapidly, the government introduced the stop at two policy. The question was how to implement it. And some ministers considered enforcing this through legislation, a legal solution. Fortunately, they asked the law minister, Mr. Barker, who advised against it and recommended that the government incentivize families instead. And that was the wiser approach. Then when Mr. Barker was tasked to clean up the Singapore River, he had to relocate the peddlers and hawkers along the river. He didn't simply evict them. He built hawker centers to be rented out 
cheaply to the hawkers so that they could continue their businesses. And therefore today, Singaporeans and tourists enjoy our chicken rice and bak chor mee at affordable prices and in orderly and hygienic conditions. Our hawker stalls sometimes even receive Michelin stars. <laughs> Mr. Barker and his colleagues place great importance on the rule of law. They recognise that the rule of law is a cornerstone of development. In some countries, the rule of law has become empty words. The courts become corrupt or compliant and governments act arbitrarily. Or, in other cases, the forms of the legal process trump everything, including justice and common sense. Legal redress becomes a theoretical option, but a practical impossibility. Our found founding fathers steered clear of both of these hazards. They built on the system of law that we had inherited from the British. They upheld clear property rights, fair and transparent rules, impartial and transparent ways of resolving disputes, and an efficient and honest judiciary. And that gave people a sense of justice and security, and businesses the confidence to invest in Singapore to create wealth and prosperity. Surveys of trust in government show that the judiciary is among the most trusted institutions in Singapore. Because our legal system is respected and admired domestically and abroad, we have distinguished ourselves from our competitors and made our way in the world. But laws cannot be static because the world is not static. Business is ceaselessly innovating. Globalisation and technology are changing how business is done and spawning new business models. E-commerce straddles national boundaries and requires sound frameworks for enforcement and taxation. Intellectual property protection and cybersecurity are serious concerns requiring clear rules and effective safeguards. Emerging technologies like blockchains and artificial intelligence will require equally innovative regulatory approaches. Up-to-date, effective but not onerous regulation has become a new source of economic competitiveness. Therefore, it's critical to keep our laws and our lawyers up to date and maintain our competitive edge. And this is where the centre can help us. <clears throat> you have a role to play through research, symposia and teaching. Your contributions should be practical and grounded in reality to improve the lives of Singaporeans and to foster Singapore's development. Your concerns should not just be about abstract theory or papers for publication, valuable as these can be. The centre should engage industry partners, businesses, policymakers, legal practitioners, other centres of legal learning in Singapore as well as in the region. In order to come up with fresh ideas and policy recommendations that keep ourselves abreast of legal developments so that we remain a preferred location for businesses, for arbitration, for dispute settlements in Asia. The Centre of Law and Business will now bear Mr E. W. Barker's name. By combining legal know-how with political instincts and a human touch, Mr Barker came up with practical solutions and contributed to creating and building a prosperous Singapore. I hope that the Centre will continue his endeavour and prove worthy of the illustrious name that you now carry. Congratulations and thank you very much.